growing up, my family raised us with certain values and uh, certain religious beliefs, but none of it was actually fully on established in the house. It was a mixture of different things, different beliefs, a lot of uh, New Age teachings and esoteric teachings. As a child, I remember family talks discussing whether Jesus really was God or Jesus Christ could have been an alien from another planet. Uh, we discussed things, is Jesus the enlightened one or could there be many enlightened ones? Are all religions true? Uh, can Jesus really be the Son of God? I believe like a lot of people, our bedtime stories were go to sleep or a spirit is gonna come in the night pull your legs, drag you under the bed, take you to hell, steal your sight, steal your, your ability to talk, things like that. These stories terrified me but fascinated me at the same time. I began to think about stuff like that. If there are spirits that show up in the night and they take your soul away, they can physically grab you and drag you to hell and all sorts of these things, who are they? Where, where do they live? Do they have an underworld? Um, are they physical beings? Do they break into your door? Do they manifest through the walls of your house? How is it that they are able to function? What kind of world do they live in? These are the questions that I thought about and even in elementary school, starting in kindergarten, I was often in trouble. I was always speaking out of turn and being defiant and you know, causing problems, fighting with other children. My mom actually talks about how embarrassed she was um, coming to school every single day to pick me up because on her way to the school, she said walking blocks away, people would already start telling her, hey, I know your son, guess what he did today? He did this today, he did that today, and my mom felt the embarrassment, so she purposely would pick me up very last. She would show up last so that she wouldn't have to see other people, other parents, and other kids telling her all the things that I did. So in elementary school, starting off in kindergarten, they actually diagnosed me with some sort of little things that they said. And they recommended that I see a school therapist or school psychologist. So about once a week or more often in school, um, I would meet up with a school psychologist with another group of uh, quote unquote troubled, at risk youth, um, children that were in gangs, active gang members or doing drugs or just had psychological problems. And I remember the kids I would sit next to and I would just think to myself, I'm not part of these kids. Like, they actually think about crazy stuff. Like, they openly joke about murdering people and, and escaping from school to run away from home and problems at home and all of these things. And I, I didn't think I would relate to them, actually. I didn't think I was supposed to be part of this group. As soon as we were able to gain access to the library, I actually volunteered my time to become the librarian's assistant. Around second and third grade, you know, I was six, seven, eight years old, I began getting these books from the library and they were filled with every topic imaginable, everything that I loved from UFOs to ghosts to spirits, mythology, uh, different cultures and different religions of the world. You know, I honestly don't believe that I ever saw a Bible in there, but I definitely was exposed to all of these other things. My favorite books were the ones that talked about supernatural phenomenon, uh, different spiritual manifestations of supernatural and things like that. I love the books that had the pictures in it. So you could see actual pictures of all sorts of things from shrunken heads to witch doctors and uh, different cultures, uh, supernatural uh, images of uh, apparitions of ghosts and all sorts of stuff. So from an early age, I began to try to contact these things. You know, if these things are real, I want to see them show up, manifest yourself. My curiosity along with my uh, family stories of the things they've experienced, the things that they've seen, I became really intrigued in the things that they were saying. I wanted to dive deeper into this world. I remember my grandmother looking me in the face and just telling me about supernatural things that have gone in her family with inanimate objects that move by themselves, seeing full apparitions, uh, I items that would levitate on themselves, um, deceased people that apparently their spirits would come back and talk to them, uh, summoning, conjuring of spirits of all kinds to be able to call upon the dead and they would actually show up. Um, supernatural healings that would occur um, during, during certain rituals that they would do, uh, certain incantations or invocations or uh, summoning of different spirits. These are the things that I, I grew up with. This is what I, I love to hear about. When I was 11 years old one day while playing at home, 
I remember playing a game of hide and seek with my little sister. I remember she had actually found me and I started to run. So I'm running around, I'm in my parents' room, running around their bed, and I just see her chasing me. I can see her long black hair that's just following me and chasing me. As I'm running, I'm looking backwards, you know, behind me, I'm just running like this. When I bump into someone, and when I bump into them, I look who it is, and it's my little sister. And I was just dumbfounded, I was like, wait, what? I was looking at her right here, and I turn around and there was no one following me. However, that whole time, this long black hair of a, of a small child was just following me. It made a little bit of sense because both myself and my brother would have dreams or, or see visions or hear voices and things like that of uh, two young girls. Growing up in my parents' home, we would see apparitions of a smaller girl, maybe seven years old, with long black hair. I could never see their face, but it was just the classics, you know, white dress, long black hair covering their face. The other apparition we would see is a teenage girl who had the same things, long black hair, we could never see her face, and long white dress. And my, my brother and I would constantly see these images everywhere, we would hear the voices, we would experience crazy things together. Another entity that I discovered um, around the age of five, six, or seven, I remember waking up in the middle of the night and having to have to use the restroom. And I would get up, uh, we had bunk beds at the time, I would climb down the bunk bed, I was always on the top, climb down the bunk bed and head towards the bathroom. But I remember just as soon as my feet would touch the floor and one foot would rise up to try to walk, I would just be paralyzed in the middle of the night with this fear, this overwhelming fear. And it was like the atmosphere became thick and heavy and dark and I just could not, I could not move. I was just overcome with so much fear. And then as I would look up, I remember seeing this just giant beast type creature thing, the silhouette, the, the giant uh, beast just looking down at me and growling and I just remember feeling the hatred and the fear, the anger and I, I just paralyzed. I didn't know what to do. I, I was about five, six or seven years old. The only thing I would do is when I was able to move, I would just run back to my bunk bed and just cover myself under the, under the covers. So with everything that I experimented in elementary school and the stories from my family and their experiences and sharing with us um, and me reading the books, I started to check out different types of books at the library. I began to ask myself, like, what is all this? How come not everybody experiences this in their home? How come it seems that only me, uh, my brother, um, occasionally my mom and other members of our family, how come they're the only ones that can get these dreams, uh, seem to have visions? Uh, dreams that they would have and then it would actually happen in the, in the real world. So when I would ask these questions, I would check out books or watch television programs and they always told you the same thing. They would always say, hey, you're gifted. Um, you're actually a spiritual medium. Uh, you actually were given powers by uh, this great cosmos in order for you to communicate with the spiritual realm. All sorts of this stuff that I fell for and I actually believed in. So because I believe that I was gifted supernaturally and I was some sort of medium, a bridge between this world and the next to be able to reunite loved ones with spirits or be able to um, conjure up other spirits that actually never lived physically, you know, demonic entities, I began to crave that power. I remember almost every single night in my early teenage years, every single night, I would cry out to these demonic entities starting from midnight to three in the morning and I would say, possess my body. I'm openly calling into the darkness, into the demons out there, into that power that I don't know. I'm openly calling to you to possess my body. I believe that I could possess the spirits. I, I believe that uh, the demonic forces and the power of the other worldly realms could enter my body and that I could come out on top and uh, physically have those powers to be able to do things, manipulate um, reality. I believe that I could use these spirits to help me in business and school and life and relationships, just have dominion and power over everything around me. During these nights, supernatural events would happen in the night where objects would move by themselves, you would hear disembodied voices, I would have terrible nightmares. I began to dive deeper into this realm, into this world. I wanted to conjure spirits, do rituals, uh, blood packs, and whatever I had to do to get this power. So in my teenage years, when I started to go out skateboarding, um, we would also do a lot of criminal activity. I was involved in vandalism, uh, graffiti and tagging, breaking and entering into houses. 
and as this lifestyle continued, my brother and I picked up two felonies each. I was 14 years old and he was just 12, but we picked up two felonies of second degree burglary, breaking and entering. The police officers actually caught me at my high school. I was handcuffed. I was walked throughout the entire school. It was actually very embarrassing. Uh, my stepbrother, they got him in his middle school. He was handcuffed there. We both went to the police station and we were in a little holding cell. And at me at 14 years old and him at 12, we got our first mug shots, our pictures. And at 14 years old, I was already a felon, charged with two felonies. Then I remember when I was 16 years old, encountering evangelists on the street, Christian evangelists. I encountered the same pair of evangelists twice. So it was this group of two people, two elderly people walking around my neighborhood evangelizing. I encountered them two times. I was 16 and I remember them coming up to me and just point blank looking at me and just saying, if you were to die right now, would you go to heaven or hell? That's it, no introduction, no nothing. Just, hey listen, I have a question for you. If you were to die right now, are you going to heaven or hell? Of course, automatically I was triggered, I was angry, I was upset. I didn't have an answer for that. I told them, I don't know. Um, I, don't, I don't even believe maybe that there is such a thing as heaven or hell. I believe that I could conjure enough spirits to exist and live forever, basically. To be able to exist in a plane between heaven and hell, you know, some sort of purgatory type state where I could still visit loved ones and roam the planet as a spirit for eternity. Very quick exchange just told me, you gotta decide man, whether you're gonna go to heaven or hell. That was it, they left. I encountered them again later on at a park. They told me the same thing. They didn't remember me, but I remembered them. Told me the same exact thing, they left right away. That question kept me up at night a few nights, but then after that, I just forgot about it. I just had plans of um, conjuring enough spirits to be able to one day open up my own store, my own shop, or something like that where I could fortune tell or do spiritual cleanses, uh, where I could be some sort of a spiritual guru and mentor to people. But then one night when I was 16 years old, a friend and I went to go visit another friends of ours. They were in a band, you know, it was awesome. It was cool listening punk music, going to shows and all of that. They were playing in their band and they were singing songs and everything and it was, you know, we're just hanging out, it was a good time. My friends in the band actually had a song where they would chant out the words, Youth Assassins. And all of a sudden, as they were singing the song, they actually replaced the words from Youth Assassins to Victor Assassins. And they would chant this in the song, and I just thought it was the coolest thing. My friends in a band, they, they go around playing and shows and stuff like that. And they actually dedicate a song to me. That was awesome. I felt so honored. Little did we know that about two hours later, someone would actually try, attempt to assassinate me. A friend and I were skateboarding down the street at a park. It was about 8 o'clock at night. It was already nighttime. It was September 30th. I was actually with my friend Isai at the time. We were skating when we noticed uh, three guys in front of us that looked a little bit strange, you know, they were walking a little weird. I remember seeing that, thinking to myself, Nothing, nothing's gonna happen. As my friend skated around them, they actually knocked them off his skateboard. Immediately, I just thought to myself, oh, these, these have to be one of our friends because that's how we, you know, roughhouse play around like that. When all of a sudden, I'm face to face with someone we don't know, telling us to give them their stuff. This was actually a robbery. We were, we were being part of a robbery. It was so crazy to me. So the guy's looking at my friend, he's telling him, give me, give me your iPod, give me your skateboard, whatever you got, give it to me. The guy who I'm face to face with, he's telling me, give me what you got. So I don't know what came over me, I was just so angry, I told him, I ain't got nothing, but I ain't giving you nothing either. The guy repeats again, give me what you got. I tell him again, I ain't got nothing, I ain't giving you nothing. After that, we begin to fight. You know, there's a fight going on, everything, high adrenaline, you know, punches are being exchanged. And I just remember one last hit that got me right in the throat. So the guy punched me in the throat and then he backs off. From there, I look at his other friends, and they have a little bat with them, and I just ask them, what are you gonna do? And all of them are looking at me and their jaws literally hit the floor. My friend, and along with these three other guys, are just looking at me and their jaws drop. 
All of a sudden, I feel the strangest sensation come over my entire body, just warm from the strange sensation. I remember grabbing my hands, lifting them up, touching my chest like this, and looking down at my hands. They were covered in blood. I was covered completely in blood. The guy I was fighting with looks at my friend and says, you better call the ambulance or that guy's gonna die. And I remember them running off into the darkness of the park. As I'm walking down the street, I just feel this blood coming and coming and coming. And there's like a, a big trail left behind me as I'm walking down the sidewalk. My friend is able to run off and get somebody's cell phone and call the ambulance. After a while, as I'm walking and bleeding, not understanding what's going on, I just remember passing out to the floor. All of a sudden, I couldn't see. I had lost sight of my eyes. The ambulance finally shows up. You know, they start cutting up my clothes and everything and checking me out. And I only had one question for the guy, and I said, uh, dude, did I get stabbed? And the EMT's looking at me and he says, yes, you have about a finger length gash wound on your throat. As I was fighting that guy, he was actually concealing a knife. He was actually cutting me all over my body. That last punch to the throat was actually a stab going in and out of my throat, hitting the artery. That's why I was bleeding out so much. As I'm in the ambulance, I'm being taken off into the hospital. I just remember thinking, I can't die. Remember what that evangelist was telling me, I can't die. I didn't think I was going to die, but I thought to myself, if I die, the eternity that awaits me is not going to be a good one. I end up at the hospital and I'm laying on the surgical table, and they had stopped the bleeding at that point. As I'm laying there, all of a sudden blood begins to just gush out, and I start to scream in pain again. One of the nurses turns around and sees my throat and just immediately grabs and puts pressure on my throat. It hurts my throat so much, but she just assures me I have to do it. Then I see the doctor come up with some sort of breathing tube type thing. He puts it over my mouth and he just says, count to three. I just remember counting one, two, and I pass out. Next thing I know, I wake up the next morning. It's October 1st, 2008. I look at myself and I have a breathing tube down my throat and I'm connected to all sorts of machines and cables and wires and something hanging here on my chest and I was just, I had no idea what had just happened to me. As the days went by, the doctors came to see me, nurses, psychologists, police officers, everybody came down to see me. But I remember the doctors specifically coming up to me and saying, if you had been there, if you had been there for about one to two more minutes, you would have bled to death. All of the blood in your body would have just come out and you would have died. So I'm 16 years old, I'm waking up at the hospital bed. I was there for a few days actually. I'm connected to machines and stuff and I'm just thinking to myself, why didn't I die? I remember one of the nurses came out to me and just said, you know, God has a big plan for your life and you're here for a reason. I didn't know anything about God or Jesus. I just said, you know what, maybe my reason is here to you know, make business, make money, you know, buy my mom a house or things like that. About two years later at the age of 18, I'm still following the exact same lifestyle I had before. Nothing has changed. I, I didn't care about the evangelists that spoke to me, about my friends that were Christian. I didn't care what they had to say. I didn't see any power in Christianity. It was lame, it was boring, it was hypocritical. My friends that called themselves Christians were not living a Christian lifestyle. I just thought it was, it was a joke. At 18 years old, I began to join a band with a few of my friends. You know, we wanted to start a band, play metal music, and I quickly realized that all of them were actually Christian. One day they invited me to a Bible study, and I said, yeah, I had nothing better to do at home. I didn't like my home situation. I didn't like the arguments at home and the problems and all that stuff. So I said, yeah, I'll go to a Bible study. <laughs> what could happen? So I'm there with the band. I'm there with Sergio, Dennis, and Sai. And we go meet Sergio's cousin, Renee. Renee's mom, Teresa, was a leader of this Bible study. So I showed up at the Bible study, I sat down, everything went normal. I don't remember anything she was talking about, I don't remember anything she said, I don't remember any of that. I just remember at the end of the Bible study, she came straight up to me, looked at me straight in the face and said, do you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And if you come from the New Age background or like American witchcraft background, um, even Eastern philosophies, ideologies, and religions, they will tell you that Jesus Christ was actually some sort of enlightened uh, wizard, enlightened wizard of his time. That Jesus Christ also did uh, miracle signs and wonders because he had powers and all of that stuff. 
So I was confused. I thought she was asking me, do you believe Jesus Christ was a real person or not? So I said, yes. And then she looked at me again and said, do you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Then something from within my spirit, just from within my stomach came out and I said, yes. It wasn't me that, I don't know, it just came in from inside of me and I said, yes. So she just laid hands on me, started praying for me and I immediately I felt the Holy Spirit right there, 18 years old. I felt like crying, but I, I didn't want to cry. I just kept it all in and I'm just like, all right, chill. So after I accept Christ into my life, it is spiritual warfare for months. I have so many nightmares and, and things, spiritual activity in my house begin to pick up like crazy. Items move by themselves in my house, disembodied voices, so many nightmares, so many just open visions and so many visitations of demonic activity entering my house. I'm, I'm being paralyzed in my sleep, having sleep paralysis so many times. So I finally decide it's time for me to get baptized. So the night before, I'm telling my mom I'm going to get baptized. She's completely against it. I'm the first person saved in my family, the first Christian, so everyone's automatically against it. But I decide to go either way. In April, on a Saturday morning, my friend Renee comes to pick me up at 7 a.m. I actually sneak out of my house at 7 a.m. Don't tell anybody where I'm going. My friend picks me up, and we drive off to his church. So we get to the church, and I'm inside the waters to get baptized. The atmosphere was thick, but it was a different thickness. It was a different, it was so light. It was almost like, just like a cloud was in there. So I walk into the water and I'm being prayed for by two pastors. And then I get baptized and I come right back out of the waters. And as I'm walking up the stairs to get out of the baptismal, all of a sudden I couldn't feel the floor. It was like I was floating. I was walking and I started to freak out. I'm just like, I feel so light, like light. And I had often gone swimming Years before, I had long hair, I have all my clothes, and I know that when you go into the water and come back out, you feel heavier, you have all that water weight on you. You're way heavier. When I got out of the baptism, and I'm walking, I can't feel the floor. I, I feel like I could probably just feel my stomach up, and I just feel like I'm floating, and I'm levitating. I'm just like, I feel like I'm floating, and I don't understand what's going on. And I feel like crying, just like when Teresa prayed for me, and I accepted Christ the first time. But I don't want to say anything, you know? I don't want to cry out loud and stuff. So they pray for me. Later on, I just feel like a spiritual shift, just like some sort of change. And then I realized, it was like, there was clarity in my mind. I just realized when I went into the baptism, into the waters and came back out, all of those demons that were just attached to me, holding on to me, trying to continue to kill me again, uh, so many other occasions, they just drowned in there in that water. They stayed in that water. And when I came out, uh, I felt so light as if I was levitating. So crazy to think that an entire lifetime dedicated to sin, dedicated to the pursuit of wickedness, to the pursuit of demonic activity, you know, being arrested, uh, starting fights and being expelled from schools and all of that stuff. In just one moment, Jesus just took it all the way. For so many years of my life, I tried to conjure up power, try to obtain all of this spiritual power. But in so many ways, Jesus revealing to me how he had always saved me from my entire life. Jesus reminded me how he had always been there, saving me from even ending up in jail, on drugs, on the street, saving me from complete demonic possession and reminding me of his relentless love to just pursue people who openly blaspheme against him, who openly hate him, who openly reject him, and how his love is greater than anything we could ever do to try to get away from him. I'm a living, walking testimony of the miraculous power of God to set any life free.